In recent years, games have managed to move beyond simple designs of basic platforming and action sequences to take your time and attention. Gone are the glory days of Sonic the Hedgehog barreling across your screen at a thousand frames per second while Mario bounces merrily across the tops of comically oversized pipes. The old tropes of ensnared princesses and worlds in peril are neither gone nor forgotten, but are no longer the norm. Simple premises, simple music, simple characters, and vanilla bland mechanics coupled with flashy, brightly colored characters are now the outliers rather than the go-to formula these days, at least insofar as indie games are concerned. In the place of stalwart brand muffins like Super Mario Bros. and Sonic the Hedgehog, we have smaller, lesser known games which have a flavor of their own. An ambiance which makes a small game seem huge. A presence, almost. These games, in the vein of games such as Hollow Knight and Limbo, have so much weight and artistry to them that calling them mere games is almost an insult. Can art and ambiance alone carry a game? We know it can make a good game great, or a poor game better. But if the artistry and music is the first thing you notice, and is so powerful that it's all you can think about, does that make it more difficult to enjoy the game on what it offers from mechanics and gameplay standpoint? This is the problem I was met with while playing Hue for the sake of this review. I was so taken aback by the sheer beauty of its simplistic art style and its powerful music that I almost didn't pay any attention to the gameplay itself until I was more or less forced to by virtue of it being largely a puzzle platformer. At first glance, the game seems like it's going to be largely story driven, carried by the weight of its presentation. The introduction to how you play is much the same as in Hollow Knight, figure it out as you go along in a simple, single directional path. When you first arrive at the beginning of the game's signature mechanic, the alteration of the world's color, you're pretty well led to believe that it's going to be pretty if simple. And it is simple. You live in a monochromatic world with colored obstacles in your way which can only be bypassed by altering the color of the world to force those obstacles to blend in with the background. But as you gain color after color in your chromatic wheel, the puzzles and world hazards get more and more complicated by virtue of an increased number of choices you have to make to alter the world between almost every move you make. Moving an object may be simple, until you realize you have to change the color of the world in order to move the object past another obstacle, but in doing so cause a third obstacle to become unreachable until you change the world again, which causes a new obstacle which you need to reach to become unreachable ad nauseum. It's actually quite fun, and while the room puzzles are not brain melting in their difficulty, they will require you to stretch your logic muscles at every turn. And once the puzzle is completed, you may well be required to combine the memory of certain color locations on the wheel with twitchy platforming reflexes as you jump over rolling rapids, avoid beds of spikes, or dodge falling boulders a la Temple of Doom. As the game progresses, you come across the occasional expositionary letter which reveals more and more of the relatively vague story narrated by a delightful British woman. All in all, I recommend this game. The art style is striking, and the gameplay is engaging once you get into it. The difficulty level isn't particularly punishing, and it's something worth playing while trying to have a mellow day. One thing of note is that I experienced a game-breaking bug in my copy where I could not wake up at the very beginning of the game, but it was rectified with a simple game restart. Thank you for tuning in, and don't forget to visit us on Facebook and join our community group.